On the Water Striper Cup Tournament is back for 2023. This five-month catch-and-release tournament, beginning on May 1st, awards over $150,000 in prizes. Every week offers a chance to win by submitting photos of the striped bass you catch from May to September. When you enter, we'll send you a sign-up package loaded with great gear, and you don't even have to catch a fish to win the grand prize. A new Tidewater 2010 Adventure Center Console. Sign up today at StriperCup.com. Welcome to the On the Water Podcast. I'm Kevin Blinkoff, and today we have Mike Wayne, the Atlantic Fisheries Policy Director for the American Sport Fishing Association, the ASA. And Mike, we're glad to have you here this week. We'll get into a little bit later what the ASA is and what they do. Um, but what I really want to talk about today is striped bass management. We had some big news this week uh, in striped bass management. A lot of questions people have about the striped bass stock. And so my goal today is kind of have a conversation with you uh, that gives people a strong background and an understanding of where are we at with the striped bass stock? What do the management measures mean? And kind of what do we see going forward for the stock? So with that introduction, Mike, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about your background in fisheries management and policy and how you got to be in this position where you are right now, where you're very much, um, I would say, an expert on how striped bass are managed. Yeah. So I'm from Nantucket, grew up there in high school. I caught a striped bass and I had a tag and I didn't know about that they did fish tagging. That sent me on a path, marine biology in college. And then Coming out of grad school, I uh, worked for the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, which is the regulatory body that manages species like striped bass, and was the plan coordinator for them for several years, managing kind of the information flow between the fisheries scientists and the managers and the stakeholders. And then from there, I said, I'm going to make a change and decided to go the advocacy road and working for the American Sport Fishing Association for the last four and a half years. Um, you know, the foundation of coming from the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission as a staff member there allowed me to really plug back into that same network as a um, policy professional at ASA, and then having the understanding of how fishery science integrates with management gave me a leg up um, to be really effective as a policy advocate. And, and coming from a recreational fishing background, it was just icing on the cake to be passionate about that journey. Right. And so what does that mean to be a policy advocate for the American Sport Fishing Association? What, is, what does ASA do and what is your job there? Sure. So um, we're an industry trade association. Uh, we have about 800 members businesses nationwide. I cover policy, fisheries policy in the mid-Atlantic and New England regions. That's my area of specialty. And so from, I work on the government affairs team there. And my job specifically is to engage in these fishery policy discussions to make sure that managers understand the significance of their decisions to the recreational sport fishing industry. Um, and the anglers that pursue all these fisheries that we, we love to participate in. So I'm trying to really relay uh, the impacts of the management decisions to those managers and relay that also back to our industry and our community. And you guys help us do that along the way. So it's, it's, it's just a good fit. And so it's really helpful to have folks like you, Kevin, on our government affairs committee, working with other industry leaders to help us understand what's going on specifically in the region, what are the issues that your readership cares about, what are the things you're hearing, what kind of information should we know so that we can help develop our policy positions that really account for those concerns and your time spent with us is really valuable for that reason. Right. And so, so On the Water has been a member of ASA for a while now. I've been on the Government Affairs Committee for, I think, about six or seven years. And like Mike is saying, it's been a great experience to be able to go there and um, express what our readership, what I've heard from people who read the magazine and contact us, what are, the, what are their concerns? What are they worried about? I can relay that to ASA, who has the ability to speak with, with managers, with politicians. And then also um, just a few months ago, we had a government affairs meeting in Washington. I'm able to go there and actually go up to Capitol Hill 
and meet with um, meet with senators and representatives and talk to them and let them know what our concerns are. I've, you know, through working with ASA, I've been brought to, you know, I'm in Massachusetts, Senator Warren, Senator Markey's offices, speaking to them directly and been able to say, I am here because recreational fishing is so important to the people of, in this case, Massachusetts, to the Northeast. Get that across that it's, um, it's a business. A lot of times I think, you know, I, I, I believe it was, Elizabeth Warren's office, it might have been Markey's, there were pictures up there of commercial fishing trawlers, these big, beautiful pictures. And I said, you know, that's iconic. That's Massachusetts. Everyone knows that commercial fishing is a business. It's money. It's important. Recreational fishing is also really important. There's a lot of us out there. We spend, you know, probably for most of us, an embarrassing amount of money to go fishing to on fishing tackle, on bait charters, staying in hotels, eating at restaurants. Um, buying boats, things like that, buying gas. And so being able to get that point across to to some of our representatives and say, be aware that fishermen are important. They generate a lot of um, a lot of economy and they vote. And these are your constituents. And and I, I can see that change. I can see that understanding happening. And I think that's really important work that's been done. Yeah. And that's that's why our government affairs committee is so powerful, mm -hmm. because it can bring that localized information to the members of Congress and the managers. And so it's really great to have your, I appreciate you spending time with us and, and taking the job very seriously. And so speaking of things that are important to our readership, striped bass, uh, definitely very important to our readership. And like I mentioned, there's been some news recently with the way striped bass are managed. Um, and before we get into the specifics on what has happened, I'd like to kind of just take a look and if you can explain as best you can where is the striped bass stock right now? What is the reason that we are looking at these new management measures? Is it is it a healthy stock? Is it an overfished stock? What's where are we at right now? Yeah, great question. So let's get into the <clears throat> complicated, challenging aspects of fishery science right off the bat. So it <clears throat> the stock assessment for uh, let let me back up and just say that. As I said earlier, fishery science has uncertainty associated with it. It's just the nature of the beast. It's hard to count things you can't see. Right. And so um, the one bonus for striped bass is it's a very data rich species. And these stock assessment models rely on good data to help drive the results. And so striped bass has that going for it. Um, and it really is obviously because of the history and, and we don't need to get into all the way back to the eighties, but um, <clears throat> there was the rebuilding of striped bass historically to the 1995 level, which is the current threshold for biomass that the ASMSC said the 1995 biomass level is the level at which we are declaring the striped bass stock rebuilt. So kind um, of an arbitrary, just looked around at 1995 and said, this feels right. This is seems yeah. to be a good number of fish. And when you look at where, you, when you look at where the stock was in the early eighties um, and where it got to in the mid nineties, it's very clear that that is um, an, a level that you could declare the stock rebuilt. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the fishing opportunities and the access went along with that too. Right. Um, and I think most people are aware, but striped bass, they, used, they describe it as it collapsed in the 80s. It got to a point where um, I've heard fishermen describe, I wasn't fishing in Massachusetts at that time, but that it was rare to catch a striped bass. Um, by the time you got into sort of, I would say the late 80s, um, that. There just were not as many. We hit a, a low point, the number of fish in the population. Yeah, and when and when you look at the population figure, the 80s, it was really low. It was, yeah. it was dangerously low. I mean, to the point where, like you said, anglers were not even en encountering fish. The fish weren't available. They weren't there. And, and the best understanding, if I have this right, and you feel free to correct me, is that the, we got to that point through a combination of catching too many overfishing and then also poor spawning, which um, 
uh, the word scientists use for that often is recruitment, which is just a way of saying how many striped bass are spawned and then actually grow up big enough to enter the population and, and make a difference in how many fish we see. Um, a lot of the recruitment problems, I think, were caused by changes to the environment, human caused changes, um, weather and conditions. But a combination of those two things are what drove the striped bass to basically collapse in the 80s. Yeah. And and. In- this is why striped bass is such a data rich species mm-hmm. is because of this story. Um, and so there was a lot of investment, not only in um, the management of this resource, but also better understanding of what are the major drivers. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and so that's where, yeah, that's where this whole, the whole premise of striped bass management is really based off of that recruitment and that year class strength. I call it the number of baby striped bass born annually. I, I just feel like that's an easier way to understand yep. it. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, the the methods back in the 80s to rebuild to that 1995 level were, okay, if they're strong year classes, what can we do to shepherd those year classes along and rebuild the population? And with that, the sp- the number of spawners will increase and hopefully kind of feed that system all over again. Um, so that was, that was the premise of, um, and those, those, uh, I don't want to get too in the weeds, but there are surveys that are conducted annually to help us understand how many baby striped bass are born. And that's where that word recruitment comes from. And that's, and that's important. And one of the reasons we know so much about striped bass, they're data rich is because they're an anadromous species that spawns in, uh, moves into brackish and fresh waters to spawn in the Chesapeake and the Hudson are the two main areas that they spawn in. Um, so as compared to say a fish that uh, spawns in the open ocean and lives um, out in the open ocean more is much harder for scientists to figure out how many are out there because you can't really keep an eye on how successful the spawn is. You really, you know, we've talked, uh, we had Dr. Jeff Nebo as a guest and he talked about yellowfin tuna that can swim anywhere in the Atlantic Ocean. They can cross over, to, you know, to to Europe. They can go anywhere. So knowing how many are out there at a given time is difficult. Striped bass stick to the coast for the most part, spawn in two specific areas. Scientists are able to go in and especially in the Chesapeake, um, pull nets through the spawning areas, small nets, give you an idea of was this a good year for a lot of striped bass being born or a bad year? Um, and I'll let you from right there. What are we seeing right yeah, now? Yeah, well, it's it's all relative. And, and just, a, just a quick comment to your, your description of the ability to understand the striped bass resource because it's within our waters, it comes into our estuaries, it runs up our rivers. My uh, master's thesis work was on the Roanoke River studying striped bass spawning mm-hmm. runs. So um, I benefited from <laughs> that <clears throat> that story. So I wanted to just <clears throat> close the loop on that. But yeah, so in terms of <sighs> spawning, we have, it, it varies, of course, and really this is a kind of a relative thing. So it's like what what was spawning like relative to years in which we know it was good mm-hmm. and relative to the years in which we know it was bad. And, and that's what they call a relative index. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the like we said, the management historically was focused on if there's a strong year class, can we make sure we shepherd those along? And so right now we're kind of in a similar scenario in which we've seen poor recruitment recently. And we know that recruitment is environmentally driven, meaning just because just because we have a ton of spawning females does not mean we're going to get recruitment success, does not mean we're not going to get a ton of baby And that's, that's a really important things. I hear that a lot from fishermen who assume it's kind of a a linear relationship that if there's a lot of big striped bass in the water, then there's that many more baby striped bass born into the population. The truth is um, it varies so much. And it's been, I think through studies have shown weather patterns have a huge effect. The spring weather patterns, how much rain there is, snow melt in the Chesapeake in particular really affects that. Um, So as long as you have a certain number of female striped bass able to spawn, it, then it comes down to really are the conditions good enough to make these baby striped bass recruit into the population. So you can track those juveniles through what's called the age structure, mm-hmm. meaning as they get older, if there was a lot to begin with, you typically see that through the data um, as time goes on. 
And that's that's why tracking the year classes is, is so important. It mm -hmm. gives us an understanding of what's to come. And year class, just as that's the idea of in a specific year, that's this the idea that stripe. the number of baby stripers born. Yeah, yes. and they call that year class. So okay. when you talk about a good year class, that's like there was a lot of baby stripe bass. When you talk about a poor year class, there wasn't a lot. Um, and all of that, and this is the science, the science is really strong on this. All of that is in more environmentally driven. Of course, you have to have a, a base of spawners to get babies, right? Right. But after that, there's not a strong stock recruitment relationship and it's environmentally driven. So um, what ended up happening was after the, the population was declared rebuilt, the manager said, okay, this rebuilt level is 1995. We're gonna, we're gonna shoot for a target biomass that's 25% higher than that 1995 level. And the, the management that occurred at that time really helped accelerate the number of spawning females in the population to about a peak in the early 2000s. And from that peak, it has been relatively continuous decline. Um, and the reasons for that are can be related to not only poor spawner spawning stock over that time frame, but or excuse me, poor recruitment over that time frame, but also um, too much fishing mortality, too much, too many fish being um, killed from fishing, uh, and so there there needed to be something done to address both of that. Now there's some. We can't get into kind of all the specifics, but there were some MREP recalibration issues that really kind of adjusted what we know about the population, but the trend stayed intact and that was one of decline. And so um, the managers worked to address that decline. And so let's just quickly review kind of what what management has occurred in the more recent time frame? Mm -hmm. So in 2014, where when I met you guys, I was the FMP plan coordinator for striped bass, and um, the managers were considering a, a reduction. Tw I think it was 25%, if I remember correctly. And the the way to accomplish that, they were considering making a change. It was 20 a minimum size of 28 inches along the coast, and it was a two fish bag. And so they decided to go to a one fish bag limit. And I, I remember there was some at the time, I mean, there were, like you said, signs, the science and also on the water, we saw that the population was declining from a high. Fishing was starting to get a little tougher and this is 2015. And there was a pretty big conservation push among most recreational fishermen. There was a lot of support behind that going from two fish at a minimum of 28 inches along the coast down to one fish at 28 inches. There was of course also some folks who said, you know, it's actually, it's not that bad. There's quite a few fish out there and uh, mostly, you know, people who depended on it for business, looking at it and saying, if I can't keep two fish, I'm not going to be able to do as book as many charters and do as much business. And that really, every time we, we make these decisions in fishery management, there's always that balance. It's what fishery managers have to do. Look at different stakeholders, look at uh, recreational fishermen who are fly fishermen, who are bait fishermen, people who want to catch and release, people who want to keep a fish charter captains who want to keep fish for their charters, commercial fishermen who have, there's commercial fisheries for striped bass yeah. in most states. Um, and that's the job of the manager is to balance all those needs and desires for whatever we decide is kind of the best for the public, which is hard to define. Um, and and sometimes the values are different across all those user groups, right? right. And so how do you, re yeah, the managers have to reconcile all that. And that's why they've rely heavily on advocates like myself to help them understand what are the consequences of their, their decisions? What should they value in their decisions? Um, but it's not an easy job, right? It is not an I easy mean, job. Ultimately, I would say most or all stakeholders at, at the baseline, they want a healthy striped bass population or a healthy fish, fish population. It's just a matter of how, how can we balance that with also what else we want? Do we want to be able to harvest? Do we want to be able to catch and release? It's it's complicated. And that's something that we, you know, like you said, that's part of your job is dealing with managers and speaking with them and trying to convey what might be the best way to balance those, those stakeholder needs and wants. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, because um, I mean, 
conservation of the resource is critically important, right? For the longevity mm -hmm. of the fishery. And we rely on that from an economic standpoint to help drive the, the economic engine there. And so making sure that the managers understand the importance of that and taking conservation action to help keep that going is really where we try to position long-term, but we also would like to see stability in the management regulations because that helps our businesses make management decisions. And so there's trade-offs there. Right. Then they're balancing all those trade-offs and they're getting a lot of input from a lot of different directions. So it helps to have those relationships in place um, and the credibility that we know we understand the dynamics here. We understand what's at play and balancing all those values is tricky. Um, and there isn't a fishery that makes it harder than striped bass. <laughs> yeah. And then, like you mentioned earlier, this is all then based on science, which is, which a lot of the science is, is very good. But like you said, in fishery science, you're trying to count fish in the ocean. There's always going to be some uncertainty. So making these decisions in a world of uncertainty, we're also... Again, another point you made that I just want to repeat where keeping regulations consistent is something that has been shown to be important. It's important to businesses. It's important to the general public. It's hard. I know being a fisheries um, a communicator, trying to communicate to our audience and explain every year that the fisheries regulations are changing and how they've changed. It leads to more people, I think, you know, maybe unintentionally breaking the rules because they didn't realize that the rules have changed. It makes it harder to plan, you know, with if seasons or if bag limits are constantly changing, you want to plan ahead. You know, you want to plan where you're going to fish when the next following season, what you're going to target. So keeping that consistent is important as well. So that's just kind of sets the table for all the challenges. And like you mentioned with striped bass and all of the competing interests there, different people wanting different thing out of the fishery, it's complicated. So Continue. Uh, I, I kind of we kind of broke off here in 2015. We went from two fish at 28. We went down to one fish at 28. The population. What happened to the population after that? Did we see? Uh, yeah. So so what seems to be happening is we'll see that in it, like when a management change is made like that, the it does have the intended effect in the short term. But then those those recruitment dynamics can make fish available, and that makes it challenging in the sense that you might accomplish the objective of reducing removals through that going from two fish to one fish. But if the fish become more available and the effort is there to meet it, then you might see a spike in response to that. So it kind of offsets some of those conservation benefits that occurred from that initial management action. And we kind of have just been in an iterative process of that for mm -hmm. the last several management changes. Um, and that's kind of frustrating, right? Because remember, like we said, the the we're trying to make, we're trying to allow the businesses to make decisions here. And so a management change occurs. We're hoping that ha that has the conservation benefits. On paper, it, it shows that it should, but it doesn't always get realized that way on the water. Um, and so that's posed challenges, not only to the stakeholders, but also to the managers. And mm -hmm. we, we're just kind of in this cycle where um, that's the case. And it, 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 there's a lot of different factors that drive that. And I, I know we want to try and get, get into some of that. But yeah, I mean, from a... At the very basic level, managing fisheries is about controlling harvest mm -hmm. and dead discards. So when I say dead discards, I'm, ref I'm referring to, I, people call it release mortality. For striped bass, it's that 9% of fish that are released that are assumed to have died, to, that are assumed to die from that interaction. Mm -hmm. And so managers have good tools to manage the harvest because uh, those are controls in which going from two fish to one fish means you harvested less fish. But usually that means that if you're controlling the harvest side of the, equa the equation, some of that just translates into dead discards. Now that comes out of savings, right? Right. Because it's instead of 100% more mortality, it's only 9% for striped bass. But that 9% can actually add up. And so that's that's really the challenge that we 
we're kind of faced with now. Um, and it's been the challenge for a while now is we continue to take actions to, or we, the managers continue to take actions to control harvest because they know that they need to reduce the, the number of removals. And removals is just a way of describing both harvest plus dead discards. Mm -hmm. And so the tools that managers have, the managers really only have great tools to manage harvest. They don't have great tools to manage dead discards. So for example, one of the tools that they use to manage dead discards are circle hooks. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's very challenging to measure the conservation benefit of a measure like that. And so the, the best way to manage dead discards is to control fishing effort. And to control fishing effort, there aren't a lot of great tools other than to tell people to stop fishing. And that is a really hard thing for the recreational fishing community to even think about. Right. Um, because that the reason we participate in the sport, the reason that our business is so big is people like to go fishing. And so that's the dynamic that's currently playing out. And so in that, from that 2014 decision, there was another t decision in 2020. That's where we got the circle hook provision to help try to address some of the dead discards mm -hmm. and harvest was again adjusted. And so keeping with kind of the coast discussion here, uh, we went from 20 minimum with two fish in 2014 down to one fish. And then in 2020, we went from 28 and they put in a maximum 35 inch slot. Mm -hmm. So you could keep one fish between 28 and 35. And again, that measure was intended to address the level of harvest, the level of fish that get taken home in the fishery. And again, it had that same kind of effect where it worked for some time. And then we see that the harvest started to creep back up and that's kind of where we are today is as the population begins to recover and, and just to give people an understanding of like, where's the population now compared to where it was in the eighties or the nineties, like we are in an increasing population trend. We have a few strong year classes still in the age structure. You probably have heard, or your readers have heard a lot about the 2015 year class being very strong. Um, and we know that strong year classes really drive stock abundance in this fishery. And so as that year class becomes available to the fishery in that slot limit, the harvest went up. The, the fish availability went up and therefore the harvest went up. So in, in 20, I believe it was, was it 2020 that we went to the slot limit? It was, yeah. And so that was part of what we're calling a rebuilding plan. So a stock assessment, they looked at striped bass and said, we've actually fallen to the point where we can say stri striped bass are overfished, meaning that there's just, we're below, I believe it's the threshold is the term. Right, that 1995 level mm -hmm. is the overfished definition. So we fell after that continuous decline in the mid 2000s, we fell below that 1995 level, declared mm -hmm. the stock overfished and initiated management action to address fishing mortality so at a level that would help us rebuild back to the target spawning stock biomass level. And with kind of a deadline of 2029 that- Yeah, not kind of, with a deadline, with a deadline of, of 2029. 2029 of we want to reverse the decline in the striped bass population and build it back up to this level by 2029. And so part of that was a reduction in the commercial quota. And part of that was a slot limit on recreational fishermen that would have us, you know, only keeping one fish between 28 and 35 inches, which would reduce the number of fish that recreational fishermen can keep. And then also uh, requiring circle hooks, which would hopefully reduce the number of fish that die after being caught and released. Yeah, and, and it's difficult to measure that on paper, but the data that we use to pick up on that signal, in theory, it should help it address some of the release mortality. And again, sometimes what we do on paper doesn't always get realized on the water, but th that was the mechanism that they used at the time to try to start addressing the dead discard portion of the mortality. And I think um, 
I've, I've heard, I definitely heard from a lot of our readers, a lot of uh, anglers, even myself, I've seen it as well. There has been an increase in the number of striped bass out there, the number of fish available. Like you mentioned, the population has started to increase over the past few years. Um, and so there's a lot of people saying, this is great. The actions we've taken are starting to work. We're starting to see more striped bass. And there's some positivity there and some hope that we could, we're going to achieve our goal and rebuild this population by 2029 as we hope to. Um, a large part of that, which you mentioned, was that there was a really great year class, a really successful spawn in 2015 in the Chesapeake. And so you had a big number of fish come out of the Chesapeake, which, again, that's an important spawning area. I think the estimate is that's around, you know, when you get up to the mixed population, it could be as much as 75% of the coastal stock is made up of these Chesapeake fish. So it has this huge, huge effect. Um, and these 2015 fish are in that, I would, I think, you know, I might not have it exactly right, but they're somewhere in that 28 to 35 inch range right now. A lot of them have, have hit that size. Last year we saw it as kind of just sub 28 inch fish, a lot, in a lot of places, good fishing. And so there's that excitement. Um, unfortunately, when you look behind that, the year classes since 2015, most of those have been kind of subpar in the Chesapeake. Is that correct? Yeah. And, and especially the last four years since 2019 really poor mm -hmm. levels of recruitment to the point where they consider it recruitment failure mm -hmm. and that's why through the most recent management action besides what happened two days ago amendment seven uh said okay if we know we have a period of really low recruitment, what can we do in our fishery management plan to address that? And so they used a lower level of fishing mortality to compensate for that low level of recruitment, but it still does not make more, by doing that does not make more baby striped bass. Right. It just tries to plan for there not being a lot of those around. And so, um, which is good in, in that, you know, we talked again about striped bass being data rich in some ways, you've got a little bit of a, when, you know, when we're from our Northeast focus, you've got a little bit of a crystal ball that you can look and see what's coming down toward you. Is it this recruitment failure you described? It's kind of scary that we depend so much on fish to come out of the Chesapeake and there's been several years of really bad spawns. So managers are able to look at that and say, we can predict what's coming rather than managing based on exactly what we're seeing right now, which is some pretty good fishing and the population increasing, they can look at it and say, actually, we've got some, some lean years coming. And that combined with trying to rebuild by 2029 has put us in a bit of a predicament. Oh yeah. And think about it, right? Like as the population rebuilds, the fish are gonna become more available. Right, it's kind of the, the, the paradox of fisheries management that as fish, start to come back. There's more of them. Um, fishermen get excited. More fishermen go out and fish. They have more success. They start catching more fish. Uh, and if the regulations allow, they keep more fish. They catch and release more fish and there's more fish mortality. So balancing that, trying to rebuild a population, which is going to increase the number, the total number of fish that get kept, killed, released and die, whatever it is, and still trying to make this target of 2029 becomes very complicated. Yes, so complicated that the board saw that coming. And mm -hmm. when I say, let's, yeah, let's kind of get into the specifics. I know everybody, this is on top of everybody's mind, including all of us. And um, so, yeah, the I want to start by saying that the Massachusetts delegation, you guys are really lucky. Uh, Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries has done a lot of work on striped bass over the years, not mm -hmm. just scientifically, but also on the management front, being kind of conservation leaders around the management table. And they have a lot going for them. The lead stock assessment scientist for striped bass is actually a Massachusetts DMF employee. And so they're able to run these stock projections based on the dynamic that we've explained up to this point, the, the year class strength, the fishing mortality and all of that, what, what the population is doing. 
And so what those projections show is kind of projecting, okay, if we know that there's some lean years coming, where what is that going to do to the population over time? And how do we have to address fishing mortality to account for that? And remember, fishing mortality is just what we talked about, harvest and dead discards. And so that's exactly what Massachusetts saw when it ran all those projections. And it said, hey, like, if we're going to rebuild by 2029, we do not have the luxury of waiting anymore. And so that's where this whole concept of emergency action came from, mm -hmm. is when they started running those protections. And remember, this is imp understanding what happened last year is, is kind of what we realized. That's where fishery science is strongest. Knowing what's coming ahead that's where fishery science is weakest. Mm -hmm. And so even though we have those um, population dynamics of what are the year class, what's the year class strength and how is that gonna impact the population, there are a lot of different other factors to account for. And so when, when Massachusetts started looking at that, they signaled to the board, if we don't start taking serious action to address removals, we will not be able to rebuild in this, this, I think what makes it even more challenging, Kevin, is um, we're trying to rebuild to that 1995 level plus 25 percent, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> we're headed in that direction, meaning the population is trending towards the target, but it, it's going to take really significant action to ensure that we rebuild by that deadline. And the dynamics that are currently playing out in the fishery are, are, are creating a lot of headwinds. Like we said, fish are becoming more available. People are going out to catch them. That means there's going to be more removals. That means fishing mortality is higher. And then you're in this constant cycle of, can we address fishing mortality enough mm -hmm. to help make sure the trajectory of the population reaches that target level and not only reaches it, but also maintains it at that. Right. And knowing that we have all these poor year classes coming right. behind Mother it. nature's not helping us. Right, so you can, you, you can probably pick up on just sort of the temperature in the room during this podcast, like the, the pressure was mounting. Mm -hmm. um, and Massachusetts said, look, if, if we're gonna rebuild this, we've gotta start acting now and so, um, like we talked about, the tools that the managers currently have are to control harvest. Right. And so that is what they did through emergency action this week is they said, okay, we need to reduce removals. We have the tools to reduce removals on harvest. And so we are going to adjust the slot limit from that 28 to 35 down to 28 to 31 to reduce the removals. Mm -hmm. Now, simultaneously, that helps protect that strong 2015 year class. Right. But this is about fishing mortality. This is how fishery science works. It's fishing mortality, it's removals, it's dead discards and harvest. So they made that harvest adjustment. And from ASA's perspective, I just really hope that that accomplishes the conservation benefit that's needed to push us more strongly in the direction of that target. Mm -hmm. um, because that's the, that's the rebuilding component here. Um, and we have that 2029 deadline. And so, you know, there's, there's where there is concern generally that will we have to continue to make changes to push us across that target fishing line. And what does that do to the stability of our measures? What does that do to the businesses that rely on this fishery? And I think that's really what's playing out right now. So I appreciate you giving me a little extra time to kind of walk through all that. <laughs> yeah, and, and then to, to back up even further, just because we keep saying they and managers. So striped bass are managed by the, the... Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, which is, uh, a compact of all the Atlantic states, mm -hmm. and they work together to develop regulations for the species that are migratory like striped bass so that the conservation that's occurring in Massachusetts um, is not 
disrupted by regulations that occur farther down the coast. There's there's some cohesion and management. So, so everyone's working towards the same goal. Right. So there's a striped bass management board. There are representatives, you know, generally representatives from the states along the coast that fish for striped bass. And so that instead of every state just doing its own thing, they get together and decide and vote on these decisions, um, such as this recent emergency action, like you mentioned, led by Massachusetts, um, which has been a leader in looking at striped bass science, has been doing a lot of research and also has been a leader in conservation. And, um, you know, and, and that, and a big part of that is I wanted to do want to give credit to the fishermen of Massachusetts and New England in general. I don't think it's by coincidence that, you know, that the striper fest, you know, brings thousands and thousands of striper anglers in there. We have invited Massachusetts DMF since the first one, Gary Nelson, the striper scientist came to our first striper fest. And I remember him looking out at the crowd and here's someone who spends most of his time, I think looking at spreadsheets and numbers yeah, in a Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> and and he, so he's been, you know, kind of thinking about how many striped bass are out there. And I think for him to look out at this crowd of thousands of, you know, frenzied striper fishermen who, you know, to say, we always say it's the beloved striped bass. It's really the way we feel about it. Um, I think that that affects them. We've had Dan McKiernan, the director of um, Massachusetts DMF, has been coming to Striper Fest as well. Massachusetts has a striper conservation plate. They've really seen, you know, and, and we've been putting it in front of them. We've, we've we, not just Massachusetts, all states, but specifically Massachusetts, forming relationships and showing them how important striped bass is and how important it is to manage them in a way that ensures good fishing and ensures good business and good fishing going forward. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I, that's why I say Massachusetts anglers and, and really Massachusetts residents are really lucky um, to have that leadership uh, because they have both a really strong science department and a really strong management to meet um, the objectives of science-based management. Um, mm -hmm. And not every shop has the resources, not every, excuse me, not every state has the resources to develop out a program like that. Um, so that's a huge benefit to the Northeast for sure. Yeah, and Massachusetts also has done a really great job of taking the license money that, you know, you have to buy a license, a permit to go fishing in saltwater now. They've done a really great job of using that money, putting it back into managing the fishery and doing science on the fishery, which a big part of that is striped bass because yeah. they realize they see the passion for striped bass and how much the, the fishermen care because you guys have told them, you've yeah. said to them, you've been, walked up to them at their booth at Striper Fest at fishing shows like the um, the Boston Boat Show and the different fishing shows in Massachusetts and in New England going up to their booth and telling them and just how passionate we are about striped bass that does make a difference and that oh, does affect how they manage the fishery for sure striper fest the consumer shows like the striped bass show and then that saltwater east show down in edison like there mm -hmm. there's really good examples of how frenzied anglers are for striped bass um and i think we all have a story like the one i started with you know just yeah. there's something that really makes it really special um to everybody. And I think that's why like the managers are, are willing to take some heat right. to say, Hey, we want to manage to this conservative target and we're ready to take action to get there. I think, um, yeah, I, I, before you leave it, don't you sit on a panel that looks at how that money is spent and make sure make sure that it goes towards projects that work or right. is that on the license side? So that's that's on the uh, license side. Um, it's an advisory panel for Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries when the without getting too into the details, when the federal government said you have to have a saltwater license, if you don't do it, we're going to do it and you don't want that. So Massachusetts said, look, we have to do it. And they reached out to recreational anglers and said, if we're going to do this, how do you want it done? And there were some uh, very influential recreational anglers who stepped up and said, if you want us to buy into spending money on a license and you want compliance, then you have to promise us that this money is going to be used and put back into recreational fishing, that a certain percentage of it is going to be used for access. So that's um, better, better boat ramps. Um, properties, wharfs, Massachusetts has built uh, some fishing piers at, you know, Deer Island and on Martha's Vineyard, um, artificial reef projects, really 
you know, has done a, a great job. And I sit on a panel, uh, an advisory panel that kind of oversees and they come to us uh, once or twice a year. We have a meeting and they say, here's how we're spending license money. What do you think? Are we doing a good job? Should we spend more here, less there? Um, and that's so that's, you know, really, again, shout out to Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries, really doing a nice job for saltwater anglers in the way they manage our fish. Yeah. Sorry for sending us on that tangent, but I think your readers would appreciate kind of knowing that you're involved in that process. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's somewhat separate from the striped bass conservation plate, which was raising money specifically for striped bass research. And I think we all, all you know, all the Massachusetts residents that are frenzied over striped bass have that yeah. on on the back of their vehicles. But yeah, they've they've put their money where their mouth is. They've they've really invested in the science to help advance the management objectives of this of this species. So they they do they deserve they deserve the credit. They're not the only state, but they are certainly on the forefront of this so um shout out to them and it's it's easy to um as as fishermen as anglers we we're not always happy with looking at the way fish are being managed perhaps and it's easy to kind of just bash fishery managers and saying these are people who um you know and we see it on co in comments a lot of times on social media of um oh they must be bought and paid for by special interests these are just politicians who are out of touch um, no, for the most part, these these are real people who are trying very hard to kind of balance all these competing needs and wants of their stakeholders and trying to figure out what is the best way to to manage this resource. Um, and, you know, the other thing that we hear is, well, I'm not even going to bother speaking up. I'm not going to make comments. I'm not going to tell them what I want because it doesn't matter. They don't listen. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. They absolutely do listen. They do respond to feedback. And they respond to, you know, they, they, you're, they're working for you in many ways as stakeholders to try to manage fish for the bet, the best of the, the public for the community. Yeah. And, um, it's really the ownership is of on the stakeholder to engage in that process. Cause it's there mm -hmm. to, it's there to help facilitate the manager's jobs of being responsive to the fishery that everybody enjoys. And the only way for them to do that effectively is for you to be communicating directly with them. Now that could come in various different forms. And I'm of the belief that if you participate in any way, you should be commended. I mean, this you're taking time out of your day, but also if the managers don't necessarily make the decision that you want them to make, don't get discouraged, don't get frustrated, right. don't get angry, like try to understand why that was the case, try to adapt, try to be kind of a positive influence in the process. And, and you know, like <laughs> the, the comments alone probably could tell you all you need to know um, about how that plays out kind of uh, public facing. But um, it's, like I said, it's not an easy job. The stakeholders play an important role and we take that job of advocacy very seriously. And so our our style is, like I said, working directly with the managers to speak on behalf of our business membership and to have them understand how significant these decisions are to recreational fishing in the business. Yeah, let's, I, I feel like we should probably dive in a little bit deeper on kind of the emergency action is that an emergency for the stock? Is that an emergency for the fishery? Kind of like digging in on it. Right. right. Okay. And and so this recent uh, spring meeting, fishery striped bass managers got together and they looked at the, the latest data. And this is not a full stock assessment, but this is just looking at the recent data. And what they saw was a huge, a, a very big increase in the number of striped bass being harvested, being caught. And that's mostly because of that 2015 year class that you mentioned growing into the slot size. And so we saw a big, they saw a big jump in the number of striped bass being caught. And it, like you mentioned, Massachusetts making projections, looking at what's going on, quickly could see we're in trouble to meet that 2029 deadline. Um, I believe there was a, a, the scientific estimate was a very low percentage shot, a chance. You know, you kind of needed everything to line up perfectly if there was any chance of making that 2029 deadline. And so the management board had that option. Here we are in spring of 2023. Do we 
make new rules for 2024 um, because the fishing season's already started. And so the normal way this would go is new rules for next year. And they would wait and get some more information, more data and make those rules for next year. And we'd see some probably some stricter regulations coming coming in next year. They looked at it and Massachusetts led and said, it's too serious to let this go by this year. Um, if we go this year continuing to fish with the slot that we have, we know we're going to keep a lot of fish and kill a lot of fish. We need to take this emergency action just to try and conserve some fish to get us through to next year where they're going to probably have to look at it again and perhaps change the rules again. Is that all pretty accurate? Yeah, yeah. No, that's impressively accurate. You've done a lot <laughs> so, of homework serving on all these different panels. <laughs> so so this emergency action happened. It was um close to unanimous. New Jersey was the only state that did not agree with taking emergency action this quickly. Um, they expressed some concerns. Several people expressed concerns about, you know, is this action really warranted? We have to think about the effect this will have on charter boats who have booked clients who are expecting to be able to come and catch a striped bass between 28 and 35 inches. Now we got to tell them it's just one between 28 and 31 inches. What does this all mean for business? What does this mean for tackle shops? What effects are these going to have? Questions you have to ask yourself. But it was close to unanimous, the decision of it makes sense to take this emergency action now, because hopefully it'll make us not have to take such drastic measures in the future in order to get to that 2029 deadline. Yeah. And I, I want to back up for a second, because this is really important. This is why fishery science and management is so tricky. Under the same regulations, under the same regulations, we went from a 78% probability of achieving the SSB target by 2029 last year to a 15% probability of achieving the SSB target by 2029 this year. So under the same regulations, we went from an 80% probability of success to a 15% probability of success. And so think about how challenging it is mm -hmm. to craft management measures that try to level out that vari variability. Yeah, I mean, the ideal way to manage a fishery is some sort of set it and forget it. Here's the regulation and now it's just going to be like this and we're gonna have great fishing for the next two decades that's just not possible yeah it's um because we're always learning something new right that's the whole mm -hmm. reason we do continue to do stock assessments and update our understanding of the status of the resource and the chat the reason why under the same regulations you see such drastically different results in terms of rebuilding success is because the fish became more available, the effort was there to meet it, and therefore the fishing mortality went up. And when fishing mortality goes up, your chances of rebuilding go down. And so this is a continuous balancing act for the managers. Um, and I think you know, some of the things that I've seen come out of the meeting kind of oversimplify that. It's like, oh, we had such a low probability of success, we had to do something. And it's like, it's not that simple. Like under the same measures, we went from 80% probability to 15. Like that that should tell you something that we we cannot perfectly turn the dial and and like you said, find measures that allow us to keep them in place and let them ride. But that's what's fascinating is that's exactly what we're looking for. Right. And I think the fishery would benefit from that. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's to me where ASA plans to try to take this. Like where, where can we get to from a regulation standpoint that would ensure we can have a robust fishery and have stability in the regulations. And the reason for the emergency was not because the population is at that 1980 level. It's not at all. It's, it's actually in an increasing trend. Right. We're actually seeing, seeing signs of recovery. We're seeing more fish available. And the, the other side of that coin is we know what's coming behind it. And that recruitment failure is going to be a punch in the gut for this fishery. And so as as the states kind of contemplated all of those dynamics and 
like we just talked about, they are complicated dynamics. They said, let's act now with the hope that we don't have to take significant action again so quickly. And so um, I really hope that it pays dividends, but I mean, you, you know, you see what the challenge is here. Like as the population rebuilds, those fish are gonna become more available. People are gonna wanna go out and catch them. And therefore the fishing mortality is gonna go up. So we're gonna, this is not done by any means. And I think what, what worries me sitting right here today after that meeting this week is it's going to be really challenging to rebuild to that uh, target level by 2029. And it's gonna be even harder to maintain the population at that level because of the poor year classes that are coming behind it. And so the, the managers are gonna have to make a difficult decision because as we talked about, fishing mortality is harvest and dead discards. And so they're doing everything they can to regulate the harvest because those are the tools that they have. There are not good tools to regulate dead discards. Um, and so <laughs> they're going to have to make a decision. Like, do they value keeping the ability to allow anglers to harvest a fish? Mm -hmm. And they are going to, I, we are going to start advocating that they need to have that discussion sooner than later because that will be fundamental to rebuilding. And I am I am not saying we are headed for a moratorium. That's not what I'm saying. In fact, the board rejected that in the last amendment. That was one of the options being considered mm -hmm. and that was rejected. So I wanna be really clear to people listening. That's and the not, idea of a moratorium, that just means zero harvest. Zero harvest, right. That's mm -hmm. the easiest way to describe it, zero harvest. So that the only source of mortality in the fishery is from dead discards. Mm -hmm. And so the board needs to decide what, do we value harvest in this fishery? And what level of harvest do we value? And, um, as from an association that represents the entire recreational fishing community, we value all of our participants because all of those individuals buy tackle from manufacturers that are part of our association. They're all part of your readership. Mm -hmm. um, and so we value the ability to harvest a fish or at least have the option to allow an angler to harvest a fish if they'd like to. And so what does that look like moving forward? And we want the managers to really focus in on that discussion. Right, because I mean, what you're hinting at but not exactly saying is that if you, I mean, right now we're one fish at 28 to 31 inches is what it will be because of the emergency action. You can't really make that slot much smaller. There's only so much you can do to reduce the number of fish being kept while still allowing someone to keep a fish. Your only other option then is to get into seasons that fish can only be kept during certain times of the year. But then if you still have to change the amount of de de dead discards, the number of fish that recreational fishermen are releasing that don't survive, the only way to do that is to reduce the number of fish being caught and released, which you can only control through doing things like no target, saying there's certain times of year where you cannot target striped bass or some other methods that somehow keep people from fishing, which nobody wants. Nobody wants to say, you cannot fish for striped bass. Yeah, I mean, if we get to that point, everybody loses. Right. Everybody loses. Um, and so it's gonna be, <laughs> this dynamic is gonna play out. Um, and I think it's really important for folks listening um, to, to really think about that because there aren't great tools to manage the dead discards in any fishery. And so what does that look like? And where, where as an industry, do we place value? And, and like I said, from ASA's perspective, we place value on allowing everybody to participate in this fishery the way they'd like to, that involves some level of harvest. What level of harvest does that look like? What can be sustained? And what are the management tools that we continue to think about to manage 
the dead discards. Mm -hmm. And like I said, right now, there aren't great tools. And I've been encouraging our industry to try to think creatively of what that might look like. Um, Because like I said, the managers don't have all the answers. And so the stakeholders should really think critically, like, what, what, what would that look like? Or what could that look like? And we've tried to influence a little bit on, on, so the estimate, the scientific estimate, the best estimate is about 9% of released fish do not survive. And, you know, on the water and, and as a media company, and I know a lot of the states as well have tried to approach this, well, what can we accomplish through education? What can we accomplish through teaching people better ways to release fish, to increase the number that survived using circle hooks, going from treble hooks to single hooks, um, reducing fight time, not targeting striped bass when the water's warm, which also makes them less likely to survive. All of these different things to just sort of hopefully reduce that number um, of fish that that do not survive being caught and released. Um, Massachusetts, again, is doing some great research. They're looking at what are the specific, you know, what are the real numbers in certain situ- situations and scenarios based on the kind of tackle that you're using. Um, we had Ben Gehagen of Massachusetts DMF on as a podcast guest, and he explained the citizen science they're doing where they're trying to get fishermen to go out and tell us about uh, how you caught the striped bass, what your tackle was, and what the condition of the fish was as it swam away. Again, all trying to get a better handle on on the dead discards, the fish that are caught, released, and don't survive, and how can we reduce that number. But getting that back into the management numbers and ha- and having that make a real measurable difference in the striper population might be tricky. Yeah, oh, absolutely. You hit it on the head. It's going to be very challenging. And and I really feel like the ownership is going to fall on individual anglers, mm-hmm. meaning if you're fishing in conditions that you know are not conducive to survival of release fish, perhaps you should say, maybe I don't want to stress this fish out as much or, you know, and, and people think about like, oh, what kind of impact can I have on an individual when there's so many, what, when there's so many people fishing for striped bass, but it's real because there are not good tools to address the dead discards. That is the way we need to be encouraging anglers to think. Yeah, your individual actions matter. And then the other thing we tell people is it's not just your individual actions. It's what you're sharing with the people that you fish with, the people around you, the behavior that you're exemplifying to them. Exactly. You can have a much bigger effect that way. Yeah, and that's why, I mean, you know, we work together on trying to produ- produce those best fish handling practice videos mm-hmm. for all the states and the, and the use of the circle hooks to help educate the recreational community. And we, we made those resources available so the states could post it on their websites because they don't have all of the talent like on the water has to produce this type of information. So there are things that we as an industry can do to help spread that message. And we've been working on that. We can do more and we're, we p- plan to do more. Mm-hmm. And when you say as an industry, I mean, I think a lot of people don't think of recreational fishing as an industry, but it is. And there are major uh, manufacturers and companies who make tackle who have, you know, we've Put it in their faces and show them look how important striped bass is you and they see it we want to sell tackle we want to sell gear we want to sell it to striped bass fishermen that means you need a stripe a healthy striped bass population and so they're getting involved in promoting some of these these conservation initiatives they want to support conservation they want to support better catch and release practices they want to um, manufacture hooks that do a better job encouraging stripe stripe bass to survive i can think we work with vmc uh, hooks right now is the sponsor of the striper cup and they're putting a single inline hook, a package of single inline hooks in every single striper cup box because they want to get people to switch out trebles um, and put the single hook on because the assumption is that's going to be better for catch and release of striped bass. So it's it's great to see this, again, this industry, recreational fishing, fishing industry, taking care of and conserving its own resources. Yeah, and, and you know, switching from trebles to single hooks it's gonna be really hard to measure that conservation benefit at a stock assessment level. Mm -hmm. But theoretically, that will help fish survive. And if we can continue to think about ways to do that over the long term, the idea would be that the fish survivability of released fish would go up. But again, it's not just hooks, it's water, it's really 
environmental conditions as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, warm water stresses fish there. And it's really important that, you know, there's not as much dissolved oxygen in warm water. The fish are exerting a lot of energy. And so stressing them out can have higher mortality effects. And it's like, you know, how do you apply that at a population level? And that's what the scientists are really trying to figure out. But again, this is about um, every individual angler playing a role. Um, you, you know, one thing you saw with the action this week, there's so many passionate striped bass anglers. Absolutely. And we know that being from the striped bass nation, you know, but it's just, it's going to really take an important individual reflection. Hey, what can I do as an angler to help give back to the resource that I love? Um, and it's going to, it's going to come with some hard decisions. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's important that we talk about it because that's the reality of right. where we are right now. And so there aren't any easy solutions and that's why I appreciate this job so much. Awesome. Mike, I really appreciate you coming in and talking striped bass with us today. It is not an easy, um, not an easy topic. Like you said, there's no easy answers, but I hopefully everybody listening to the podcast today kind of has a better idea of how fishery management works, what they're dealing with in the case of striped bass, and then also what they can do as individuals, both in the way that they fish and uh, the way they handle striped bass, and then also in speaking up and getting involved in the management process, sharing their opinions, their thoughts and feelings about how they want to see fish managed. Yeah, no, I appreciate you having, having me on and trying to break down the complicated nature of fishery science and management. And um, yeah, I mean, we all, have got, we all have to try to work together as one community to try to, to accomplish the conservation goals that we want to see in this fishery. And it's going it, to, it will be a challenge, but I think one thing we've learned is anglers are up for that kind of a challenge and we got to just try and empower them to, to keep, keep yes. doing one thing anglers always have is hope. So, <laughs> yeah. and I hope that mother nature helps us out a little I know, bit. We could use it. We could use we some could good conditions, use good it. conditions and a successful spawn in the Chesapeake would go a long way. So fingers crossed for that. But, um, yeah, yet another challenge. <laughs> <laughs>